Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. Yeah, wow. Was there any more attempts on your life, your brothers and your life when he came in? And maybe not from him, but still from your mother. Was there any other examples of that occurring? Yes, it was. Uh, I, I watched... I watched my mother one time. Um, I remember just calming out of my bedroom. It was a Saturday morning. My stepdad had gone, because he was a plumber at the time, and he had gone across the road to the shop because we'd moved out of Bidwell and we'd moved to a place called Dun Dundas. And across the road from us was a was like a, a street strip of shops. It was like a fish and chip shop and a milk bar and pharmacy and all those things. He was over at the fish and chip shop do, doing some plumbing for them that had, al- had already been planned. So it was sad Saturday morning. I was getting up, ready to go into the lounge room and watch the Looney Tunes and all, and all of that, expecting to see my brother in there as well. And I walked past my mother's be- bedroom and she was sitting on the edge of the bed with David in tears. And when I looked, she had a knife at his throat. Oh, um, I froze, of course. I hadn't seen my mother in that state in that sort of almost like a catatonic state that she used to get in. I hadn't seen that for a while. When I saw that, my instinct was um, to scream at her and there was no response. And I went into the room and then she just pulled the knife closer to his throat, but she wasn't making visual contact to me, like eye eye contact with me. She was just in a state. And David was screaming more and more and more. So I ran across the street to, to where I knew my stepdad was. I remember running into the shop and just yelling at him saying, mum's got a knife to David's throat. And he was angry at me because, well, I don't know why. You caused a scene at the shop. Pretty much, yeah. So I remember he ran over there. um, I was in tow. He ran into the bedroom, literally just walked straight up to her, grabbed the knife out out of her hands threw it down and then just proceeded to beat the living crap out of it. And that was her? Yeah. Yeah. And that was in front of all of us. And that that was the first time that I saw him be physical with her. Um, And it was kind of funny too because all I could think of was don't hurt my mum. Yeah. Don't hurt my mum. Don't. um, And it was funny. He could hurt me as much as he wanted, but. Don't just don't hurt my mum. Don't hurt my brother. Don't hurt my sister. Um, and even though he he'd saved my brother's life, I hated him because he, um, because he hurt your mum after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember a little while after that, there, there were times where my mother's parents would get involved as well, and they were kind of the the source of all of her issues. Yeah. They would be over after that event. Um, and I remember she was starting to, to go off again. And then, and then uh, my stepdad struck her in front of her, her parents as well. Um, and I was expecting them to stop things, but they didn't. They just allowed him to do it. And then stored over her while she was on the ground saying, that's what you get for hurting your kids. That's what you get for upsetting your husband. Um, don't bother us again and don't come and see us. Let's see us again. And then they left. Um, so it was just this weird world that I was in. It was just a strange, strange world where abuse was a daily thing. And when I look back at it now, it's, I can't believe I got through it, but, um, at the time, it was it was it was all I knew. Yeah, it became normalised, but still with the fear mm. or anxiety, or or I suppose waking up that morning wondering when it's going to happen and how it's going to happen today. Mm. So you you said your mum was in many different on on a few occasions in this episode so far. You've mentioned your mum being in this particular state. Is this state drug related, alcohol related, um, psychosis related? What's the picture for your mother there? I'd say it was more psychosis related. Um, it wasn't an, until I was a teenager that I remember my mum being drunk a lot. Hmm. 
Previous to that, well, to be honest, I don't remember her drinking at home a lot when I was smaller. Uh, it wasn't until I was maybe 10, 11, 12 that I remember her. Once she was comfortable having a man around, uh, then she started to drink at home. Um, my stepdad, of course, was drunk every night. Uh, there was always beer, beer in the fridge. And then all of a sudden there was a cask of wine there as well, and that was my mother's. But pre previous to that, I had no recollection of, of her abusing substances at all. I remember her coming home drunk, and I could remember the difference between her being drunk and not. And most of the times that she was um, very abusive to us small kids, she was stone cold sober. Hmm. And a lot of the plans that she had would be when she was stone cold sober. There was a time when I can't remember exactly how old I was, maybe seven or eight, when no, actually I was younger than that. Maybe again, five or six. It was a very turbulent group of years there between four and six and then another group of time. Uh she had hatched a plan, I'm not exactly sure <laughs> what her outcome was supposed to be, but for weeks and weeks and weeks, she was coaching me to say that my name was Matthew Johns. Not my name is Matthew John Charles, but she would um, try to coach me into saying that my name was Matthew Johns, Matthew Johns, Matthew Johns. And they, they, this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then we went to Westfield Shopping Centre in Parramatta. And she sat me down and she said, stay here. I'm going to be gone for a little bit. No matter how long I'm gone, don't move. And do you remember what your name is? And I'd say, uh, yeah, Matthew Charles. She said, no, no, your name is Matthew Johns. Don't forget your name is Matthew Johns. Okay, no worries at all. So she was basically trying to coach me to saying that my name was different, that my address was different. And then I remember sitting there for quite some time. And then I saw a, either it was a security guard or a police officer walk, walk past and I hailed him down and said, my mum's been gone for a while. And they took me up to their office um, said, what's your name? Of course, I've sped out my name. <laughs> Matthew I Johns or Matthew Charles? Mum told me to say that my name was Matthew Johns. Oh. But, but my name is actually blah, blah, blah. And within an hour or so, I remember she was back there. And in the meantime, they're being really nice to me, the lollies, and soft drink and all kinds of things. I, I, I had a great time. Uh, and then I remember her coming to pay, pick me up. And I remember how cold she was when she grabbed me by the hand and took, took me out, literally dragged me all the way back out of the bus, didn't say a word. And then that night, if I can remember correctly, I don't know whether that was the night that um, the whole car accident thing happened, or the whole car thing ha happened, mm. um, or there was another severe beating, but that night well, she she was particularly bad um, oh, wow. because i didn't i didn't play 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 along with things what was her intention um, of that that day because obviously it's premeditated if she's training you for weeks to say your name what what was going on that day there i mean you might not know to this day but what do you think was happening there well i think she wanted me to just go away she wanted, she wanted us gone. She wanted me to go away. Um, she, just from the way that she, I remember her, I just, all I remember is the way that she was coaching me. And, and when I would, when I would say what my name was, she would get angry. And when I, when I went along with the game and she would uh, praise me for it. So it was obvious that she was trying to coach me to, so, so as I wouldn't reveal my my identity. So then, when I was found, uh, I'd be put into foster care or whatever, and they wouldn't be able to find out who I was and who my mother was. Hmm. So therefore, off I go into foster care or wherever I'm supposed to go after that. I'm not too sure. I mean, that's not somebody in the in the level headed mind, is it? The, their mind's not no. intact if they think then she's not going to be found just based on one surname being different, right? Um, 
how young can you remember the the abuse? I mean, you've already said five or six years old, but it, was there any abuse before that? Did there any form of abuse be, be, begin before the beating when you were even younger? From what I can remember, yes. Uh, my earliest recollection um, was being in a laundry and completely naked in a laundry. I'd been there for quite some time, very, very cold, no food. Uh, and that was at, from what I can remember, that was at my grandmother's house. Uh, my mother had fallen pregnant with my brother when she was 19 uh, and then fell pregnant with me when she was 20. So she was very young. Mm -hmm. So at that stage, she, she, she'd had three kids before she was 21 or 20, 22. All the and same dad? No, no. Three, three different guys or two or? I, to be honest, I don't know. Oh. I, yeah, I just don't. Um, and, and, it, and without going into it too deeply, because that, that's also a very, very long story, um, the, the father who she told me that I was, who was supposed to have fathered me, I don't think ever, ever existed. Uh, I remember trying to find him when I was... Uh, 18, 19, I went to New South Wales. I tried to look for him, uh, went to the place of employment that she had said that she was working at when she met him and he used to work there too. They had no no rare records of that, that man ever existing. Hmm. I went to police. I, I searched high and low. And, and then when uh, my wife and I got together, she tried to help me as well and we couldn't find him yeah and at that stage my mum was just still alive i questioned her over and over it whether or not he was actually my father or who my fa father was couldn't get a straight straight answer out of her mm. i think he kind of decided that that's the story and she's going to stick to it yeah um yeah so i don't I, to be honest i i don't want to look into that any further no yeah sure yeah, I'm, 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 I'm afraid of what I'd find. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll yeah. go back to your uh, the laundry room being naked in there then, because I cut you off. Sorry. What, what was that? Uh, that that was at my grandmother's house. Hmm. Um, she didn't like me very much at all. Um, my old brother David, he was named after my grandfather, so he was, I suppose he. He, he, he was loved, I suppose, in a sense, or wanted or was the favoured out of the two of us. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know, but apparently I, A, I was supposed to be a girl <laughs> and B, I was obviously unplanned as well. So, uh, and one child was obviously enough, but two was too much. But then she had my sister, so she had a girl. Um, so my grandmother, who was a very cruel woman, was uh, she didn't like, like me at all, and all my memories of her was was just cruelty. She was she wasn't physical with with me in a sense, but um, the emotional and she was just cold. She was just really really cold. Yeah. Um, so that was my earliest memory that I, when I try, try to think back where things started was in that house. Uh, and my mother went from living there with her parents to her housing commission unit in Bidwell. Uh, and then from there, of course, she met my father and, you know, mum's life started to improve a little bit after that. So, um, but my grandmother, was I, I'm suspecting her and her father. I, 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 I don't know what went on. I don't know what um, type of abuse that my mother suffered, but she obviously did. And coming from that family uh, who a lot of them died young, a lot, and a lot of them died mysteriously, um, and there was there was there was just always something going on. There was always somebody, somebody dying, somebody being murdered, uh, and lots and lots of state secrets. There was always lots and lots of secrets. 
Yeah, wow. Well, what you, um, was the, it, I mean, we've talked a lot about, or oh, we'll get into the mur- the murders because obviously that's that's unbelievable. But the um, we've talked a lot about physical abuse. Was the and there's obviously many types of abuse. We've mentioned we mentioned emotional abuse and and things like that. Was there any sexual abuse anywhere along the line for any of you in you and the family? Yes, yes. Um, not it's kind of one of those things at the moment where I I'm not sure how far I want to go with all of that now, um, but. Basically, there was no stone unturned when it came to that. It was, um, yeah, the, it was, and it wasn't just things that happened to me. It was what I'd witnessed. There was, there, and of course, were stories that I'd heard over the years as well. Well, the, there was, it, it was just ripe, and, and, and it was every day. And it was, and it was, and it seemed like nobody had been left untouched. Um, uh, all of my aunties, from what I could tell, had been abused. Uh, most of the kids, uh, most of their kids had been abused in some way, shape or form, whether it was small, whether it was large, whether it was um, when they were very young or when it was when they got a little, when they became a little bit older. But it just seemed that everybody had suffered in some way. Um, yeah. So you've got, if we look at categories of of people that you, of categories that you've had to endure, or your family members, or you're at least aware of through connection to relatives of aunties, uncles, whatever. We're going. We're talking about alcoholics. We're talking about uh, drug addicts. We're talking about rapists. We're talking about murderers. We're, I mean, we're covering pretty much every category of any form of abuse here, aren't we? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, where in your timeline then did murders happen? Did you see a murder? Did you did you lose a family member to murder? What happened yeah. there? Uh, for the first one that I can remember was the first my one. auntie. Um, <laughs> now, my auntie was the youngest daughter. Uh, she became rather religious. Uh, my fam- all the family were from the Catholic side of things. I'm not a religious person, but uh, they they all were. Mm-hmm. Um, well, they pretended to be anyway. Um, but my auntie had sort of started to dive into it quite quite a lot, and had kind of found solace with uh, with her faith. She met a bloke uh, who was. A really nice guy, from what I could tell back then, and the category of who I thought was nice and uh, acceptable back then was somebody who was kind to me and didn't abuse me. Um, he was a very gentle person. I, I remember that we used to go and stay at their house, so the three of us would go and stay at their house, and we'd be lavish with attention. And be given you clothes and given food and, and um, taken on picnics, all that sort of stuff. And, and for those mem- memories, I'm uh, really, really grateful for. And I remember just being in their company was always good. They hadn't had their own child um, when I was very young. Uh, and then they had a son. Um, and he was maybe eight or nine years young, young, younger than me. Um, and I remember we were at home one day. We'd moved to another place because we, we, we used to move around a bit. And I was in maybe grade one or two. I can't remember exactly when. when. And there was a knock at the door. It was the police. And they said that uh, Auntie, Harry, Auntie Karen had died. And that was all we were allowed to know at that stage. And it wasn't until maybe six months or 12 months after that that I found out because all of a sudden Uncle, Uncle Rob was gone and he wasn't at the funeral and not that we were allowed to go there, but um, I would never saw Uncle Rob again. And I was like, well, I, did, I didn't understand where he'd went. And then when my dad was drunk one night, he was, he was saying to us, you know, you know, all of your side of the family are all shit, they're all garbage. Um, your uncle Rob murdered your auntie, 
And at that stage, we didn't know how she died or, or anything at all. But it turned out that, that one night, I don't know why, and I still, still, still don't know why, but he strangled her to death. Um, and he did that while, I think it was the weekend after, we, we, we had been there one weekend and then during that week, some, something had happened. I'm not too sure. Um, but then after that, we'd hear all the stories about how, uh, my auntie would be, um, uh, over, like extremely over the top, which doesn't, uh, not fit the family model, mm. uh, where she would just lose her mind. He was trying to calm her down or something like that or, or something that happened, had some sort of argument and which had obviously caused her demise. And from what I can gather now was that pretty much as soon as he did that, he jumped on the phone, called the police and said, I've just murdered, murdered my wife, admitted to it. I mean, and then it was a little while after that I remember about the trial because I remember seeing it in the newspaper paper how he had openly admitted to doing it and he you know, and that he pled guilty um, and he ended up going to Long Bay for a long, long time. Um, I think he ended up serving that 25 years. Um, so that, that, so that, that was the first one. And that one was hard for me to accept because I loved him. I, and, and my auntie, they were my, uh, they were my release. They were my safe place. Yeah. Like somewhere that, I was actually loved and cared for and all of a sudden it's gone. Do you think he, because you meant you painted a really good picture, do you think about him, do you think he hit a red line and, and that's, is, is, is that where it was? Or do you think he, he was just different behind closed doors and, and there were, he was just as bad uh, um, as the rest of how they conducted themselves on a, on a daily basis? That's a good question. And to be honest, I can't answer that. Yeah. I suppose all I can all I can say is from the perspective of a child was coming from a house with nothing but cruelty hmm. to a house which seemed like nothing but love. It was really hard for me to accept that. It was really hard to confusing, isn't it? Not only did I lose my auntie, but I lost my uncle. Yeah. Did you ever go and see him? No. No. That, all of that was forbidden. Oh, really? And by the time I be, by the time I sort of become old enough to make my own short choices, um, revisiting that was not an option for me. That was, so you yeah. never connected with him once he was released. No, no. Yeah, wow. I remember he was, actually he was released when I he was released when I was twenty five, I think. Yeah, so I think he did about 20 years, yeah. So you were five when he went in? Yeah, look, timeline's a little bit sketchy for me, but um, yeah. when my grandmother finally passed away, uh, he made the choice to go and reconnect with him. And as, and, and as far as I know, he'd gotten out of jail and they had um, – they had uh, got got another house together and and started to 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 resume their life. Um, and I remember, and this is a Facebook era when Facebook first first came came out. I remember getting a friend request from him, and he thought, "Yeah, that's that's a path I'm going to go go down. I don't want. I just don't want to open that can can of worms or dive into that side of the family again." Yeah. And it's a, such, such a shame as well, isn't it? Because there was, you just remember as that love. I suppose you can keep that love in that box, can't you? And just remember for what it was. Um, yeah. 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 So that was so that was the first murder. Uh, I'm not aware of it. I'm, I was aware of that one, but I'm not aware of any, I don't believe I remember or looking at my notes that there was any others. What What was the others? Uh, my, my other auntie, who was the oldest daughter, in fact, she, she was the oldest child. Mm. She, um, she was the troubled one, I suppose you could say. She was, um, she, she was a drug addict. Uh, she was also an alcoholic, but she was also extremely fragile. And I remember 
there were times where my stepfather had to go and save her from a few nasty situations. And then one day she decided that she was going to move back in with her mother, which is my grandmother. And then pretty much as soon as she moved back in, because there was no drugs, no alcohol was allowed, because it was one, one thing about my grandparents, there was never any alcohol. And especially with my grandmother, she was such a cunning person. It was, it was like she wouldn't allow anything that would upset the way that she thought. Um, so she never drank. She never took anything. And even medication, she never took anything. She, so my oldest auntie had moved in with them. And, and of course, we all knew that there was a strict ban on any on, on any such substances, so she couldn't do that. But then she just got sick. Um, and she ended up staying in bed, and she was sick for eight or nine years. Um, and she would stay in the bedroom, and my grandmother would care for her. My grandmother would collect a, a pension because she was sick and was her carer, uh, and she just stayed sick until eventually she died. Um, oh, I, I don't know, know what to deduct from that other than yeah. physically she was okay before she went in there. She wasn't sick before. She was, she'd had issues with drugs and alcohol, but she, was, she, she wasn't a sickly person. Nobody yeah. in the family, to be honest, was never – Anything like cancer, there was no heart disease, there was no there was no sickness mm. at all. Um, but she just got sick and she stayed sick and she stayed in her room and she just slowly got worse and worse and worse. My grandmother kept collecting check after check after check. Uh, got all the sympathy, was you know, she was a saint to her friends because she was the one that was care caring for her. Um so I didn't know what I didn't know what what to make of that. Um, yeah. I, I, I dare say there's viewers that are listening right now saying, "Well, there is a name for that." <laughs> yeah, Munchausen we... by proxy. Oh, what? Sorry, Munchausen's by proxy. <laughs> so that's a condition. Munchausen's is a condition where you um, you inflict a sickness or an injury, and then you want the sympathy and the admiration. I suppose, and by proxy is uh, when you do that to somebody else. And um, my wife is a mental health nurse, and she knows a lot of this stuff inside and out. Um, yeah. And she said that you know it's classic signs, but not that she's making an official diagnosis or anything else like that. No. But when you put all the pieces together, and when you hear the story in depth. To her, it's very, very obvious what had actually happened. Yeah. So that was the demise of all the girls in my family. Um, while all the boys seem to do okay. Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? I mean, that 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 what you just said about your grand um, the grandmother. It's like a form of um, the grandmother. Sorry, it's like a form. It's like an extreme version of gaslighting in a way, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose if you put it into a modern context. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I do remember you talking about that, actually. Um, we obviously went down the, the assumption of poisoning, didn't we? we? I remember us using the word poisoning quite a lot during our pre-chat and that discussion. Yeah, wow. Yeah. All right. So she was hand-fed every meal. Yeah. Anything in her way was given to her by, by my grandmother. She was the one who who took care of absolutely every aspect of her life. Did anyone question it? No. Wow. Yeah. No. Like, yeah like Actually, it. I, remember, I remember my mother saying something. There were, I do remember times where my, my mother would argue with her hmm. about um, and she'd be hysterical. Uh, but then she'd be quickly hit or slapped or my father would shut her up yeah um, yeah yeah so there were there were questionable times when things were asked but it didn't lead anywhere yeah wow 
and even after the death, no one suspected anything it's, other than yourself when you got old and you become mature and perspective and wise. You, you just put two and two together, but no, prior to that, nothing. No, no. Wow. Just, yeah, just another one of those things to put up on the, on the board and, an, and another um, questionable uh, side of things, I suppose. Yeah. So if I'm doing my calculations correctly, we're we're around we're around the teenage years uh, for yourself, right? Am I am I correct in that? Roughly, you're a teenager. Where 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 does your behaviour, where does your journey go for you as an individual? Because obviously that's a lot to take on. Um, even though it might be normal to hear people being murdered, that can't be normal. Even if you are being brought up in a abrupt uh, atmosphere, where did you go with all of this? I mean, before we go there, is there anything else that we've we've missed? Maybe. Um, oh, look, you know, the, the, there's a lot, but yeah. um, when you're surmising, I suppose that there were the pivotal moments, of events that um, I can sort of clearly remember. Uh, there's a a lot of ins and outs, of course. There's a lot of yeah. There's layers to it, isn't there? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I suppose you know, without without sitting here for hours about my tales of woe, mm. um, it is, yeah, these pivotal moments are the ones that I can remember. Yeah. Um, when I, the thing is, is all, all of that happened to, all of that was before I was halfway, all I can remember is sort of halfway through primary school. And in oh, the wow. interim time, I'd been sort of shuffled around and moved. We'd, I'd, I'd been in and out of, homes and in, in, in and out of foster care um, and then always ended up sort of back at at my mother's house. Um, I remember when I was maybe 10, no, I was 11, we moved to Melbourne because my stepfather was originally from, from, from Melbourne and I think for him too it was he, he wanted to get away from my mother's family as much as um, – as much as he could. Mm. Um, so we moved down to Torquay and then we stayed in July. And then I, I think we stayed in uh, a house that was owned by his uncle um, for a period, period of time and then moved to uh, another housing commission estate in Belmont, um, mm. which is uh, a suburb in Geelong. Not too far um, from where I live, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and... I think it was from there that I, it wasn't long after we moved there that I, I had started to not care anymore, I suppose, and, and start, started to rebel a lot. Um, and so in response to that, uh, my father's beatings or my stepfather's beatings would become far more physical, whereas he used to be very good at just mentally being, being being able to stomp you down, I suppose. And with a good a few good hard hits on on the backside was enough. But then one, one, once I started to become an angry an angry, very young man, um, I needed a lot more suppression, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So his side of things started to uh, increase substantially. And at that point too, the alcoholism with both my parents was starting to ramp up a lot more and a lot more when they were drink, drink, drinking every day, uh, sick every morning, um, and things like uh, school fees didn't get paid. Now, we, we didn't have clothes to go to school with. I remember my brother going to school in shoes with holes all through through them and torn up tracks with track, track, track pants and... Uh, and we went to school with food and, yeah. So then, you know, the poverty side of things started to get worse because he couldn't find a job as a plumber. Um, so that was how we were just relying on welfare. And the poverty then was quite bad. Uh, so for me, that's when I started to take things into my own hands. Uh, I would start stealing food, stealing money, uh, and it was all to to eat. <laughs> it was all just to eat. Just, just to survive yeah. and get through, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And 
kind of when I think about those types of things that I did, all I can do is blame myself for it. I mean, I can understand the circumstance now, but uh, for a long time, I just beat, beat myself up about it because it was all on me. I I did bad, bad things. Yeah. And I, I've got this conscience now. now and, you know, I've, I've always had it, but I had a conscience where um, I couldn't steal anything. I couldn't take something that was mine without feeling some form of anxiety or stress because of it. So when I was doing these things, I, it was highly stressful, mm. um, highly anxious, but I needed to eat. Yeah. And I, remember, I remember getting caught a couple of times. I remember there was this shop in Belmont called Bilo, and they had this delivery dock out the back, and every morning, we'd, four in the morning, I'd jump over the fence. This is middle of winter. Freezer cold, as you know what the what the, uh, the what the wind winter in Geelong are like. Yeah, um, I'd be out of bed at two o'clock in the morning or three three o'clock in the morning just to make sure that I got there before the deliveries of the bread and the milk, so I could jump over the fence and grab a couple of coffee scrolls and a couple of big M's. Um, but I could only get away with that for so long before the owners were starting to clue onto me and were laying in wait. I remember one time jumping over the fence and I got caught red, red handed and beat with a stick. Oh, wow. I managed to get away, which was good, but obviously that had cut off my food supply there. So I had to find something else to eat. Yeah. Um, so then it, it sort of spread into fine, finding open car doors and stealing coins out of cars. Um, until eventually I finally got a paper round and then I would use that to get by. So that was kind of the start of my rebellious years and that that was also about the same time that I knew that I needed some type of structure in my life and that's when I found martial arts. I remember a friend of mine at school was in grade six, I think, and he was um, – you know, performing kicks and everything else out, out of the playground. And I've got this bio on my page all about it, so I kind of know it word for word now. And <laughs> and I was in awe of what he was doing, and I just thought thought it was fantastic. And, of course, at that time, you know, that was when, you know, years after that was when the Karate Kid movie came out. I was just enthralled by it. Um, found out where he was training, and I decided to go up there one night, and I sat at the back, back of the class and... Um, I remember just thinking to myself, this isn't exactly what I needed. This was, this was, this was structure and discipline and this was the right kind of, you know, everyone was getting yelled at. But to me, it, was, it, it wasn't abusive. It wasn't um, detrimental to your mental health. It wasn't, yeah. uh, it, was, it was guidance. And I remember the way that they, I remember the way that the teacher spoke at the end class, the way that he addressed people and rewarded them for the hard work they put in. It was, that was something I'd never had before. It was something I, that I'd never seen. I, I didn't know that that existed. Yeah, of course. I mean, you totally see. Uh, from, from the discussion today, we can totally see why it was martial arts and it wasn't something else. It can offer you role models. It can offer you that um, yeah. the role model. Um, I mean, I don't know if there's any females there, but I can certainly imagine why you would have a, um, be connected and drawn to the role model of the male in that scenario. The structure, the discipline, the uh, but the defensive side of things as well, being able to protect, even if you never physically use it to your advantage, just the... The, the safety that it brings to the mind and able to but just protect with that physicality that it brings to the game. I can totally see, I'm, I'm sure we can all see why you went down that, that path. Um, but again, your story goes a lot deeper, right? You, 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 you've joined the club uh, and it's yep. offered you purpose in life now. Yeah. Where yeah. What made you stick with it and not go, well, this is a hobby and I'll just go and get a normal job. I think because it was mine. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.